Hello, my name is Johannes Ulrich. I'm the Dean of Research for the Science Technology Institute uh, College. And in this uh, video, I want to talk about OS command injection. Why OS command injection and why now? Well, first of all, OS command injection is probably the most severe vulnerability that you may have in a web application. I talked last time about SQL injection, another one of those injection vulnerabilities, which can lead uh, to operating system command execution. But OS command injection is pretty much always remote code execution. So kind of the most severe vulnerability out there. Why is this still an issue? Why is it an issue now? Well, there are two vulnerabilities that sort of inspired this among others. One was uh, this vulnerability in Rust. At least was advertised as a vulnerability in Rust, but turned out it inf affected more or less any language uh, that attempted to execute operating system commands in Windows. Uh, PHP, Python, uh, other languages had fixes for this vulnerability as well. Rust was the first one to fix it, which sort of you know, gave them the fame of being the vulnerable language uh, here. But this is far from just a Rust a problem. The second uh, vulnerability was uh, disclosed a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this vulnerability is in Fortinet's 40 seam. What's sort of remarkable about this vulnerability is not just that it's a secure device, that the code is actually being executed as root, but uh, also that they had two extremely similar vulnerabilities within a couple of months. Last year, they had uh, the first vulnerability, and that's the red part here on the slide. This is a screenshot I took from the Horizon 3 AI website. They talked at length about this vulnerability and uh, the root causes. You can also check some of the source code and see what went wrong there. Uh, but uh, the first vulnerability affected the first parameter in this API call, the server IP. Well, the second vulnerability, literally the next uh, parameter uh, was vulnerable here, the mount point. Uh, so exactly pretty much the same vulnerability here, uh, but uh, yes, you know, discovered uh, different by different people and uh, not fixed when they just uh, fixed uh, the first uh, vulnerability. Actually, they fixed the second vulnerability kind of silently and then later came forward uh, that they actually had uh, the second vulnerability here as well. But anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about what is OS command injection and uh, what's sort of the big deal of it, how does it happen, and of course, I'm always interested in the defensive side from a developer's point of view, uh, how are we actually going uh, to prevent uh, this vulnerability. So this is the basic sort of exploit pattern here. We're executing an operating system command ping. And uh, in providing arguments to the command, the attacker is able to also provide code because we are not separating code and user data properly. There are a couple different ways of doing this. I sort of used here the three that I think are sort of the mo most common ones. There are more than that, but an ampersand is very common backticks. Uh, the dollar parentheses, I actually see this the one that's being missed the most. We have the pipe character uh, can be used, semicolons. Uh, so a couple different ways how this can possibly be exploited. The root cause is, well, as so often, mixing user data and code. We talked about how this is a bad idea for SQL injection. It's a bad idea here as well, where we just add random user data without proper input validation uh, to our command. And then of course, now we're not separating commands and user data properly. But as you can tell so by the prior slide, there are many, many ways how you could possibly exploit OS command injection. So that input validation part is not always that straightforward. And uh, that's sort of another we talk a little bit about defensive strategies when it comes uh, to OS command injection. Now, the first thing that you should always look for is, do I actually have to execute an operating system command? So, for example, if you do want to ping an IP address or a host name, well, uh, there is a PyPing module that you can use. That way, you don't have to execute an operating system command. I haven't looked at the source code of PyPing yet, if it sort of crafts the ICMP or 
if it itself uh, then uh, calls the ping command, but let's hope they're doing it correctly. And remember, now IP addresses are relatively straightforward to validate. When you're talking, looking at host names, uh, it gets a little bit more tricky. And uh, that's then often you know, where the mistakes are being made. So the other issue is, of course, just like when we talked about SQL injection, you may not need to provide the entire command as a string, like you do with the system call in uh, Python. And I'm focusing a little bit on Python, but you'll later see it's actually pretty much the same thing across uh, different languages. Python instead has this sub-process uh, module, and it allows you to pass the parameters as a list uh, to ping. And there are a couple different uh, functions, methods that you have within uh, sub-process uh, to execute commands, but that's the basic principle you're looking for here. You're no longer mixing data and code, but you're doing something similar like what you did with uh, SQL injection when you parameterized the query. You're passing the command and the arguments separately to the operating system. And that way, the particular libraries that you're using can take care of uh, the actual cleanup and uh, escaping or input validation or whatever they're doing to prevent operating system command injection. At the back end, what's really happening, and that's sort of the neat reason why, at least in the Unix world, you have commands that are uh, pretty easy to use, and uh, no matter what language you're using, you have this exec API. It's implementing the standard uh, libraries, so uh, the standard C libraries, so PHP, uh, Python, all these languages really just call these library functions. And the big one here is exec. Exec implements this feature where I can pass a command and then arguments to the command without having to actually pass it all as a string. There are a couple different variations uh, of this command, depending on whether or not you sort of use the arguments or uh, the, the, the environment or whether or not you're passing like a path where, where you're searching for commands. But the basic principle here is if you're doing exec, you're actually passing the command and the arguments separately uh, from each other, which protects you from OS command injection. Now, there's one sort of disadvantage when it comes to exec. What exec does is unlike the sort of a little bit simpler system, exec will start the new process that you're trying to execute and re replace the current process with a new process. So actually, the calling program will exit. That's not always what you want. Sometimes you want to wait for a response to come back, which means that you have to include the exec in a fork. You first have to fork to start a new process, then you call exec. In Python, we do have this sub process uh, module, which actually takes care of that for us. You can still do a fork and exec. You still have that ability if you want more sort of fine grained control over how this exactly happens. But sub process kind of abstracts that a little bit, makes that a little bit easier uh, to use than calling exec inside a fork. So that's really what you want to do. Use exec. Yeah? And uh, that way, command injection kind of goes away. Now, if you, for whatever reason, you don't want to use exec, uh, maybe, you know, because of that uh, process replacement issue, like I said, subprocess takes care of that. Well, uh, different languages give you different commands to actually escape command parameters correctly. In PHP, you have this escape shell argument, escape shell command commands. In Python, you have SHL X module, that's the current one that you should be using. There's an older one, the pipes module, and they have functions that allow you to do proper escaping. And there are a number of different uh, functions they offer. So, you know, pick the one that you need for your particular uh, purpose if you decide to go this route. The other thing, of course, you can do is, again, going back to not actually executing operating system commands. If you do have to execute operating system commands, make sure the parameters are easy to validate. I told you earlier how you know host names can be a little bit tricky uh, to, uh, to validate. I actually had an OS command injection uh, vulnerability in some code uh, back when I was young and stupid, where I actually passed an, an entire address on the command line. 
and you know a mailing address and uh, mailing addresses are you know notoriously difficult to validate because characters like ampersand semicolons uh, may show, show up legitimately in a mailing address that a user entered and um, that's actually how I figured out that I did it wrong is that the script failed at an address where someone I believe it was a semicolon you know, had entered a semicolon uh, in their address well, uh, the way I solved this particular problem was where I passed just a number instead of the address, and the number basically was the name of a file. And then the actual address was written to the file, and then I could open the file, read the address, and in that particular create, uh, case, create like a PDF uh, with a mailing address label. So um, that's one way of doing it. You know, don't pass complex arguments on the command line. That way it's easier to validate. If you still need more complex data types, then maybe base64 encode them or maybe hexadecimal. That way, you know, if you have the address, you base64 encode it. Uh, that makes it sort of safe on the command line. You still have the pluses and the slashes potentially here, uh, but um, uh, not really exploitable anymore as an OS command injection. You no longer have spaces, no longer have semicolons, you no longer have ampersands and other uh, dangerous characters. Again, this requires that you're able to actually modify the code or better, you know, as you design the system, you sort of put these requirements in to make it easier to validate. Even if you're using some of these safer methods like exit, I would still recommend you know, make it easy to validate. You know, Defense in depth. Don't just rely on one measure to fix all the vulnerabilities. And then, of course, you know, always be ready for something to go wrong. And that's you know, where you do want to reduce the permissions of whatever script is being executed. I mentioned in the Fortinet case, it was actually running as root. So it had all the permission it ever wanted. And uh, that, of course, you know, makes this vulnerability a lot more severe but not that it would be a ton less severe if it would run as a lesser user. You're basically just one privilege escalation vulnerability away from actually becoming a root. But the lower the privileges of the process being executed, of course, the lower the risk. And let me just sort of give you here a one complex example and one reason you know, why systems like uh, FortiGate and such and uh, these IoT devices, routers and such, when they do have these vulnerabilities, their web servers are often running as root administrator with elevated privileges is that they do need to adjust things like firewall rules. So the web application may need to run that IP tables command. And then of course, you, know, uh, you typically, that's easiest done uh, as root. So that's sort of why they do it. And then you may end up with some more complex parameters. Like the address here may also be a host name. The protocol, you may not just accept the protocol number, uh, but you also may want to have like UDP and TCP and ICMP. So the strings even work for some of the service names. You may not just want to 80, but uh, HTTP or domain instead of... Uh, 53. So uh, that makes things uh, more complex when it comes to input validation. So let's take a look at, you know, how could we do this particular example a little bit more secure? So let's first look at, you know, validating the IP address. If it's an IPv4 or v6 address, I'm a huge fan of these INET uh, functions. Now you have to load the appropriate uh, module, uh, but the reason I like them is, again, they're linked to one of these basic system libraries. Uh, the socket library you know, is implementing all these INET functions. You're typically also using the socket library then to connect to these IP addresses if you ever need to connect to it. And uh, that way, you're removing some of the ambiguities of uh, an input validation library interpreting IP addresses differently than the socket library does. By using the socket library for input validation and to set up the connection, you avoid these ambiguities. There are some famous things like uh, IP address in Octal and such with socket accepts, uh, but some of the input validation libraries uh, did not necessarily deal with correctly. So this is a little code here. You have this inet python uh, function, which basically converts the address into a binary. Uh, I don't want to call it a string, uh, but um, 
It works for IPv6, it works for IPv4, and if that fails, you know you don't have a valid address. So that's why we basically use these exceptions here uh, to detect a failure. Uh, there are other ways to do that, but um, that's sort of one way, you know, how I prefer to do input validation. When you're doing host names, you could just try to resolve the host name. Now, that's a little bit tricky. Sometimes the host name doesn't have to be resolvable or it's not resolvable at the time you enter it. Uh, so this may or may not work for you. And this gives you an error if the host name is syntactic correct or incorrect or if it doesn't resolve. So uh, that makes it a little bit tricky. If this does not work for you, if you do need to validate host names that are not resolvable, uh, then of course you can look for any other Python modules where someone has thought about it or use a regular expression. Before you go the regular expression route, do a quick Google search for how to validate a host name and just be amazed at all the discussions that evolve around, you know, what can and cannot happen in a host name. Uh, these regular expressions get tricky if you are really trying to be careful as to what's a valid host name, what's not a valid host name. Of course, if you're just uh, concerned about OS command injection, then you know things like, for example, the length of the host name or the length of individual labels inside the host name may not be such a big issue, or you know if they can start with a number or not or with a dash. But um, it's still you know. Try to do it right. Try to do the regular expression if you go that route uh, right to properly validate the host name. The other thing, of course, you can do is privilege separation where you limit the privileges that a particular uh, part of your software has. And there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, of course, you have sort of change root. That's sort of the uh, good old way of limiting what a particular script has access to. In Linux, uh, you also have capabilities. I, I find this is an, an option that's often overlooked. Instead of just running something as root, you can assign it certain privileges that uh, with respect to the kernel. Uh, like, for example, uh, to capture packets uh, or whatever you needed to do without giving it full root access. Uh, SA Linux, App Armor, you know, these are other technologies that you typically have available that also allow you to restrict uh, what a particular script is able to do that you're running. This is, again, another layer of um, security, not going to prevent OS command injection, but it is going to limit the impact. In particular, if you feel like you must run this particular code as root. But then again, you know, maybe you can get away without running at least the web server as root. Where, for example, the web server just you know, again writes a configuration file and then it sends a signal to a specific process that will read the configuration file and apply it. And that script may run as root or may have access to some of these capabilities without having to assign them to your web server, which of course at least reduces your attack surface somewhat. Now, why is Windows different? And now let me go back to the Rust vulnerability as I called it earlier. Uh, this vulnerability here was also called bad, bad, but if I pronounce this uh, correctly here. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a fundamental problem in how Windows executes operating system commands. So in Unix, it's really POSIX, a standard that sort of Unix is built on, uh, we do have exec. Windows has some POSIX components, but doesn't fully implement it. In particular here, it's sort of lagging instead of exec, well, it has create process, and um, then you also have spawn. What it does is it really starts command.exe and then passes the parameters to command.exe. First parameter being the command that you want to execute, and then whatever parameters that, that particular command has. Now, spawn does actually some escaping of command line arguments. So it does that part well. However, you can also pass variables, environment variables, as part of the command line. Those environment variables, well, are just passed along to the command. 
kind of as they should be. The tricky part is that there are command standard environment variables well that represent characters like for example quotes command 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 line uh, weird name for environment variable but yes it's being resolved to the quote so uh, you can add that variable to your command line and then as command.exe executes it after spawn validated the commands it will replace it with the quote this is actually sort of another little bad pattern here where we first validate the input and then we actually keep changing the data uh, but uh, that sort of leads to the problem that now you before you actually send the data to spawn or uh, create process you have to make sure that there are no variables uh, being used there are a couple other things, and I don't want to go into too much details in the Windows-specific ways, like, you know, for example, fix the extension of the script that you're running, to you actually know what you're running, you know, whether you're running a bad file or uh, a .exe here uh, that you're passing. But um, overall, it's much more difficult in Windows to safely execute operating system commands than it is in Unix, which is why all these languages had problems with it. They should have it fixed now. Some of them, I think Java, if I remember correctly, did not fix it. They said, hey, it's up to the user to deal with these environment variable, user being here, the developer, uh, to basically decide whether or not they would like to allow environment variables, or if so, which ones uh, they allow. So quick summary. First of all, avoid executing operating system commands whenever you can. And then if you have to run operating system commands, make sure you make the data easy to validate, never mix user data and strings and uh, commands. So make sure you're using something like exec or you know, one of the wrappers around this that your language uh, provides you with. And uh, yes, particular on Windows, be careful, figure out how your language deals with this variable problem if you are executing operating system commands. Well, anyway, that's what I have for you here. So thanks for listening and uh, hope to see you. Hope to see you at some of the upcoming conferences. I'll be teaching the Def 5 to 2 class where we'll talk about this and a lot of other th things at Sans Fire in July. And again, you know, would appreciate to see you live there. So uh, thanks and uh, talk to you some other time when I come up with another vulnerability in the next couple of days. Bye.